Let's just have a word of prayer as we think about uh, the Word of God. Father God, we thank you that you speak to us in many different ways. But Lord, thank you that one of the primary ways you speak to us is through the Word, the Bible. And thank you that the Bible has taught Christians right down through the ages. And over the last 2,000 years, Christians have believed the Word of God as revealed from Genesis to the book of Revelation. So thank you that you speak to us through your word. And I pray this morning, Lord God, that you would speak to us through your word today, that we will be open to your Holy Spirit, opening up the scriptures to us, giving us greater insight, greater understanding, and not just knowing about the word, but knowing the word, Jesus, the living word, deep inside our lives and hearts as well. So we welcome you, Lord God, to come and draw near to us, to come and be our teacher, and to come and take us deeper into the things of God Almighty. We welcome you in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody loves a makeover, something transformed from old to new. And I'm, to be honest with you, I watch very little TV almost nothing, maybe sport would be the one thing that I might occasionally watch, but, um, but I've got some illustrations from some old TV shows. I don't know if they've ever been shown in Thailand or not, but probably in the UK and one or two other countries they certainly have been. And let me just show you the first one here. This is, I think, from a TV show called um, Bangers and Cash. Uh, and you can see at the top left of your screen a very old, rusted-out car. It's actually a Mini Cooper S, 1965 Mini Cooper S. It spent 40 years in the open air just rotting and rusting and decaying, and you can see how terrible it is in that uh, top left-hand side of the picture. The blue and white car that you see there is exactly the same car well, virtually exactly the same car, but it's had an incredible makeover. So someone has brought their car in and says, can you do anything with this? And a team of experts have spent, you know, a month or two, and they've made this car from this old, rusted wreck into this beautiful, bright, shining Mini. It's been made over. It's been totally transformed. We can see the old, and we can see the new. Let's take another illustration. Um, this, I think, is an old TV program called Ground Force, where somebody is having trouble with their garden. They can't look after it properly, so they get a specialist team of people um, <clears throat> who will come in and look and decide what they can do with the garden. And you can see it was full of bricks and just a, a building site, and now it's been transformed. It's a beautiful new garden that you can sit in and you can smell the flowers. It's been made over. The, you can see the old and the new. And then the next one is, I think it's called Extreme Makeover. I've never watched it, but um, we see here an old house um, that was derelict, empty, falling apart, and then a team come and they make this house all beautifully new and you can see the before and the after picture. Now you might ask, Matthew, why are you showing me these things as you know, start of a you know, sermon on the book of Acts? Well, let me tell you, as we read the book of Acts, and particularly this morning, this is our second session in the book of Acts, we're going to be staying in the book of Acts for a little while, looking at different individual people that God uses mightily through the book of Acts. Last week we looked at Luke. Today we're looking at Peter, the Apostle Peter, and the book of Acts. And we're looking to see how God used him, how God led him, what happened to him. And if you look at the life of Peter, we see a complete transformation before he is filled with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, and then after he's filled with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. There is a complete change, makeover, transformation in the life of Peter. He is, just a few weeks before, we can have a look, you know, he, he, he's changed from one person to another after the Holy Spirit has come upon him in power. And you know, 
God wants every Christian, you and I, to allow Jesus Christ to come in and make over your life and my life to transform you and me, that we might become more like Jesus. And the way that that can happen is as we allow and welcome the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, to come into our lives and change and transform us. That's what happened in the life of Peter. We can see that before being filled with the Holy Spirit, he is scared, he is frightened, And then we see after he's been filled with the Spirit, he is a man who has been transformed by the power of God. The Holy Spirit specializes in taking a Christian's life, just like yours and mine, and transforming us. The Holy Spirit will sweep away all the rubbish, all the dirt, all the dust, all the rust, all the weeds, all the hurt, all the pain, all the wounds of our lives, and will pour in his Holy Spirit in a way that changes us and in a way that transforms us. That is the book of Acts in a nutshell. It is about the acts of God the Holy Spirit through the apostles. And we need to see that if we're going to understand the book correctly. So, That's just by way of introduction. I've just got several points, and what I'm going to do this time, normally I would take a Bible passage and make several points from one particular Bible passage. Today, we're looking at Peter and the book of Acts. So what I've done is to take four or five different scriptures which give us a a snapshot of Peter and just make one point from each of those snapshots as we just look at what's happening in Peter's life during the book of Acts. So let's begin in Acts chapter 2. Peter is empowered by the Holy Spirit to speak and to preach. And this verse that I'm just about to read, in Acts chapter 2, 1 to 13, we see the Holy Spirit that last week we were speaking about, the, the disciples were told to wait for the promised Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, 1 to 13, the promised Holy Spirit has been poured out. And there's a great big crowd gather, and then what happens is what we see here in Acts 2, 14, and verses 38 and 39. So the Holy Spirit has fallen, then Peter gets in front of a big crowd of maybe about 3,000, he says this, then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Wow. Well, this isn't the Peter that we've read up just earlier on in the end of the Gospels. Peter's hiding away. The doors are locked. He's fearful of the Jews. Um, He's denied Jesus three times on that first Good Friday in the court of the high priest. Three times. I don't know Jesus. I'm nothing to do with Jesus. No, I don't know him. He even starts blaspheming and calling down curses. I don't know Jesus. That is Peter just a few weeks before what we've just read in Acts chapter 2.14. How is it possible that Peter can be transformed from somebody who is denying Jesus and scared of the authorities to suddenly this after, Peter's a different man. He's he's confident. He's, He's preaching the word of God boldly. What has happened? Let me tell you, there's one thing that's happened to Peter's life. He's received the filling of God the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity in his life. And that has changed him, has made him over, has transformed him. And that is what God wants to do in my life and your life as well, is to do exactly the same. And the Holy Spirit gives Peter the confidence to preach his first sermon. And actually, it's a very good sermon if you go through it. We have, we've, I've just skipped it just two verses from it. Uh, the homework is to go back and read these accounts, and I'm just giving you a pen picture of in a little bit more detail yourself. 
But Peter preaches a good sermon. He makes some good, clear, structured biblical points. He uses good use of scripture and the word of God. He has a, you know, he, an, a, you know, tells them to repent and points them to Jesus, gives an appeal for them to respond. And he says, this Holy Spirit has been promised for you and for all who are far off, it says. Um, all whom the Lord your God will call. The Holy Spirit, please know this, the Holy Spirit was never just given for the 12 disciples of the early church. That is a total misreading of the book of Acts and of, of, of the New Testament. Here it's very, very clear in this first sermon that Peter preaches. He says, the promise of the Holy Spirit is for you and your children and all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Well, I think many of us here are those whom the Lord our God has called. The Holy Spirit was not just for Peter, just for the early church. It is for all. You cannot have good biblical exegesis if you, we're going to take the Bible seriously. We cannot airbrush out who the Holy Spirit is and what he wants to do, how he wants to change a person's life. And this is what's happened to Peter. This is the only way that we can account for the transformation, the before and after message. And you know, without the Holy Spirit in his life, Peter is doing absolutely none of this. He's staying in his locked room with the door shut for fear of the Jews. Not anymore, he's not. Now he is a changed man. And the same thing is for you and for me too. Trying to live the Christian life without being empowered by the Holy Spirit is just about impossible. So that's the first point. Second point, from a different scripture now, Acts chapter 3, Peter is empowered by the Holy Spirit to heal the sick. Acts chapter 3 just taking verses 6 and 7. You can read the whole of Acts chapter 3 for your homework. But Acts chapter 3, 6 and 7, just giving a summary, another, another snapshot window into the life of Peter in the book of Acts. It says, Then Peter said this, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking the crippled man by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly his feet and hands became strong. Let me just back up a little bit, because I've just given you two scriptures, two verses here. Let me tell you what's happening in Acts chapter 3. So Peter preached his first sermon, and then it's probably some weeks later on, might be a month or two later on, he's walking to the, the temple. And he walks past the same person he's seen sat there every day because this man is a man who's been crippled from birth. He's never walked. And every day, I don't know how old he was, but he's maybe 30 or 40 years old, every day he is laid near the temple gate so that everyone's going to walk past him. Everybody who ever went to the Jewish synagogue knew this crippled man. He was always there begging, seeking a few baht, please give me a few baht for whatever. And this time, Peter goes, walks past him, but he, he, he says, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And Peter steps out in faith, steps out in the gift of healing. He's been filled with the Holy Spirit. He lifts this man to his feet. And suddenly, this crippled man is walking and jumping and dancing and praising God. This man has received an incredible healing through the power of Jesus and God the Holy Spirit. Amazing. And everybody in Jerusalem cannot deny it. Everybody knows this man. He's always there, week in and week out, month in, year in and year out. So suddenly this crowd gather around Peter. Wow, this man's been healed. What's happened? And there's a big crowd gathering around Peter. And Peter, you know, just a few weeks later, he's giving his second sermon. And again, it's a very good sermon um, that he preaches. He preaches, um, he points them to Jesus. He says, this is not by my power. I'm just, you know, I was just a fearful man, afraid of everybody, afraid of the, of the Jews, afraid of what was going to happen to me. This is not me. This is the power of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ of Nazareth that this man is healed. So he preaches another sermon. And... Um, 
And um, the interesting thing is this. Any follower of Jesus in whom the power of the Holy Spirit is operating is just like Peter. Enabled to speak healing in the name of Jesus. The gift of healing is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit written about in the Bible. We see the gift of healing in operation throughout Scripture, right back to the book of Exodus, all the way through. And certainly, of course, in the life of Jesus, we see him ministering healing to many people. And we see it in the early church as well. The gift of healing is a gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's a gift that um, any of us can, can operate in, but we need to ask God for that gift of healing. We need to ask God for that gift of healing. And what is the gift of healing? It is the God-given power of God, God the Holy Spirit, to bring healing to a person in the name of Jesus. Simply, that's what it is. And it's a great gift if you've never ever prayed a prayer for somebody and maybe prayed that God might heal them or asked God that God might heal them. Why not somebody you know? Speak healing over their lives in the name of Jesus. It's not our power ever. It's the power of God the Holy Spirit. The gift of healing is a biblical gift, Old and New Testament. And that's what Peter is operating here. The Holy Spirit has been uh, changing him. Let's look at the third one, the third point. Peter's empowered by the Holy Spirit to, for holy boldness, to be bold. Again, the whole context is Acts chapter 4, but I've just picked out um, a couple of verses, three verses, verses 8 to 10. It says this, it says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, and them is the Sanhedrin, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Here's a man, here's, a, here's Peter, praying his second. Now, the interesting, he's got a different audience. The previous two audiences Peter's been speaking to are the public, the general public, people are out and about. This time, Peter is talking to a different group. It's a much harder group of people he's got to be. It's a committee. It's particularly, it's a Sanhedrin. It's the, the 70 rulers of the whole of Israel. People who knew their theology, who knew they were teachers of the law, they were scribes, they were Pharisees. They knew everything there was to do about Jewish law. And this is who Peter is preaching his third sermon to. He's preaching to the Sanhedrin, a star chamber court type committee that could be ruthless. And so what happens? Peter's preaching in the temple courtyard, and then the police arrive, because they're looking down, and some of them are tut-tutting, what's all this commotion happening? So they send down the, 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 the synagogue security guards and the police, and Peter and John get arrested, and they get actually thrown into jail for a night. Uh, why do they get arrested? Why is Peter arrested? For one reason, because he's healed a man who's been lame all his life in the name of Jesus. And that's why they're arrested. He's interrogated the next day, interrogated by the Sanhedrin. And again, I love it. Verse, verse 8, where it says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Peter is speaking his own words, but the Holy Spirit is helping him, is encouraging him, is giving the confidence and the boldness to stand before a fearful committee, the Sanhedrin, who you know, have all sorts of powers to do anything that they want. And he's interrogated, but he's speaking to them in confidence. And it's interesting, in verse 13 it says, when the Sanhedrin saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. 
Peter is no longer intimidated. He's no longer fearful. The Holy Spirit has dealt with his fear, has removed his fear. He now has a holy boldness put there by God the Holy Spirit. Peter is a transformed man. Peter is a man who's on fire for God now. Nothing is going to put him off or stop him. A few weeks ago, he feared everyone, <clears throat> including even the girl on duty outside the high, high priest's uh, uh, courtyard when three times he denies Jesus. Now, Peter doesn't fear anyone, not even the religious rulers and the elite. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God that gives us a courage to witness to Jesus. And we see that in the life of Peter. And we can know that in our own lives. One of the main reasons why God wants to give every Christian and every church the fullness of the Holy Spirit is so that we too can be witnesses for Jesus. Peter has to be a witness for Jesus in very difficult circumstances. Most of our circumstances aren't as difficult. They might be, but many of them aren't. But God wants to empower us to tell others about Jesus, and it's the Holy Spirit who helps us to do that. Fourth point um, is Peter is empowered by the Holy Spirit to be obedient to God. So the first three that we've looked at have all happened within probably just a few weeks, months of Pentecost. Now we're looking in Acts chapter 10. We're probably about seven years on. Difficult to be exactly sure on the time scale, but now we're probably about six or seven years on from the previous references we've looked at, the previous chapters. Here in chapter 10, it says this in verse 28. And again, the whole of Acts 10 is the context. Peter said, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or even visit them. But God has shown me that I should not call any person impure or unclean. So what's happening here? Let me just explain. This is about seven years on. And Peter has, has, has moved, uh, has, is just at the moment staying in a Town, a small town called Joppa, or Jaffa nowadays, right by the sea, beautiful spot right on the Mediterranean. And he's staying with Simon the Tanner. And one, one day, one morning, Peter gets up and he's on the roof, and God gives Peter three times the same vision from God, the vision from heaven. And it's of a big sheep being lowered down with all sorts of unclean things and animals in the midst. And God says to Peter three times, do not call anything impure or unclean that I have made pure. And God is starting to speak to Peter. At exactly the time that this vision that Peter has finishes, three people arrive from Caesarea, from the home of Cornelius. Cornelius is a Roman centurion. He's a Gentile. He's not Jewish like Peter. He's a Gentile. And, and these three guys arrive at the gate and say, does Simon live here? And they say, well, yes, he's up on the roof. Simon realizes that God is speaking to him, and he goes down and welcomes him in, gives him something to eat, and then the next day, two-day tri- two, two journey pretty much to get to Caesarea, Peter, with these guys, travels to the house of Cornelius, who's a Roman centurion, probably an Italian. He's certainly not Jewish. He's definitely a Gentile. And this centurion invites Peter to step over the threshold into his actual house. You might think, well, that's no big deal. Let me tell you, it's a huge deal. No Jew would ever go into the house of a Gentile, ever. It was against all the rules. It wasn't kosher. It wasn't the right thing to do. But God is speaking through the Holy Spirit powerfully to Peter and starting to show Peter that, do you know what, Peter, I didn't just come for the Jewish race and the Jewish people. I come for every nation, every tribe, every tongue from the north, south, west, eastern cardinal points of the world. I've come for everyone. And I've come for the Gentiles, equally as I've come for the Jews. And Peter, he has to step out of his comfort zone. His comfort zone is keeping within his his Jewish understanding of everything. But God's saying, no, you need to know, Peter, 
that God the Holy Spirit, Jesus, God the Father, is for every person, on every nation, on every continent, in every tribe, every tongue. And Peter is starting to get his head around this as the Holy Spirit is showing him things from Scripture and is speaking to him. So he goes in and he talks to Cornelius. He starts to preach, I think, forget now, I think we're on our fourth sermon of Peter's. And he tells them about Jesus and he tells them about the need to repent and, 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 and all those sort of things. And actually, Peter hasn't even finished his sermon when suddenly the Holy Spirit that came and fell upon mainly the Jewish people at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, here in Acts chapter 10, the same Holy Spirit, seven years later, is coming and falling upon a Gentile congregation, a Gentile group of people, the same Holy Spirit. And like in Acts chapter 2 there, they're worshiping God, they're praising God, they're prophesying, they're speaking in tongues. The Holy Spirit has come upon them. And Peter and one or two other Jewish brothers that are with him, they're just astonished. Wow. So God, the Holy Spirit isn't just for us, not just for the Jewish race, it's for everyone. Wow, gosh, it's a light bulb moment, a really important moment in the history of Christianity as we see what happens in Acts chapter 10. The Holy Spirit has transformed Peter. He's transformed his life. He's just transformed his words, he's even transformed his thinking. I used to, my old self, I used to think like this as a bit of a narrow band Jew, but actually now I'm still Jewish, but actually I realize that God is for all, for everyone, not just for some. And God has to, you know, affect, you know, impact the Holy Spirit, Peter's mind as well. And the Holy, the same Holy Spirit falls on all of them. Praise God. How is all this possible? The reason is is because Paul is plugged in to the third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't have one here with me now, but I, there's, there's a PowerPoint socket just there with some, some cores into it that are giving power to you know, the, the screens you can see. Let's just imagine I had a vacuum cleaner, a nice shiny brand new vacuum cleaner right here. A vacuum cleaner, we know what a vacuum cleaner is. It's to, to clean the floor and to tidy up the rubbish and all the other things. But a vacuum cleaner will only work if you take the electric cable and plug it in to the power source. Without being plugged into the power source, this vacuum cleaner looks like a vacuum cleaner. If you touch it, yes, a vacuum cleaner, but it's not going to do anything. It's not going to operate in the way it's intended to unless it's plugged in to the source of power, electricity. Exactly the same is true for every Christian. Every believer in Jesus has been designed by God to be plugged in, not to the electric socket, don't do that, please, but plugged into the third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit. That is the default position for every Christian, is to be connected with, filled with, plugged into, whatever language you like to use, to be filled in, to be empowered by God the Holy Spirit. And it's that which has changed and transformed Peter's life. And you know, not just Christians, but churches too. There can be many churches that are, praise God, you know, they, they do their stuff, but not every church is plugged into the Holy Spirit. But actually, the early church was so plugged into God the Holy Spirit that even when they were persecuted, they changed the world. Wherever they went, they couldn't stop witnessing about, about Jesus. So the question I ask myself, and the question I ask you is this. Are you plugged in to the third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit? And it's a yes or no answer. We're either plugged in or not. God wants us to welcome and embrace the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. All of them equally are co-equal, co-eternal, co-omnipotent. And God doesn't say, well, you're a Christian. You, you accept Father and Jesus, but you're a Christian and you, you don't want to accept the reality of the person of the Holy Spirit. How can you be a Christian? You will only ever be the before. You'll never be the after Christian, which God 
intends you to be. The Holy Spirit isn't just for a Pentecostal denomination. The Holy Spirit is for every believer default. The Holy Spirit is not in any way controversial. He is the third person of the Holy Trinity that every Christian should welcome and embrace. But we have to ask God to fill us with his Holy Spirit. Otherwise, we will be doing our best and struggling hard and trying our best and doing too much in our own effort and not enough with actually the Holy Spirit equipping us and helping us. And that's what the, who the Holy Spirit is. He wants to encourage us. Matthew, you need confidence. You need boldness for this. You can't do it on your own. I want to help you. Will you allow me to? Or are you just going to do everything in your own strength? Sadly, so many churches and so many Christians operate effectively. We've got our head knowledge, but then in our own strength. And God's saying, Jesus is saying, there's a source of the power of God that I want to make available to you and to every church. So the vacuum cleaner illustration, be welcome. You know, don't be a Christian, a sadie who resists the Holy Spirit. Well, yes, God the Father, yes, Jesus, but I'm going to keep the Holy Spirit at arm's length. Please don't. You can't be a biblical Christian and do that. A biblical Christian, you have to welcome and embrace the fullness of God the Holy Spirit. That's what changed the early church. It's what the New Testament is all about. It's, it's what God wants every Christian today in 2024 to be all about too. The fullness of God the Father, the fullness of Jesus, the fullness of God the Holy Spirit. Not just, well, I'll have, you know, 98% of Father and Jesus, and if I must, I'll have 2% of the Holy Spirit. Not at all. It's, it, it, God is co-eternal, co-equal. We need all three. Okay, skipped on a bit too quickly, thank you. Then, let's look at the last point. We're doing well with the last point. I think we're on point five now. Peter, empowered by the Holy Spirit, receives an extraordinary miracle. Again, here, Acts chapter 12, we're probably about AD 42, so we're maybe about 12 years now after Peter was first transformed by the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. We're probably about 12 years on now, give, give or take a few years, in Acts chapter 12. And let me just read just three verses, verses five to seven. It says, the night before Herod was to bring Peter to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. The angel struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Let me just tell you what's happening here in Acts chapter 12. In Acts chapter 12, King Herod, there are, there are five Herods uh, in the New Testament, and sometimes it's difficult to, to you know, oh, is it the same King Herod? As, no, there, this is King Herod Agrippa. So it's um, one of the Herods, Herod Agrippa. He is, has been persecuting the church. He's already had James. If you remember, Jesus had an inner circle of Peter, James, and John. He's already, King Herod has already killed James. He's had him put to death, one of those three inner core of disciples. And now he's arrested Peter, Peter's in prison, and Peter is just about the next morning to come up before the magistrates, and Peter is going to put, be put to death as well. He's on death row. He is, his life is, is, is just about up. And he's in this prison, and he's, interesting, the night before he's going to be put to death, he's fast asleep, so sound asleep that the angel had to give him a bit of a, a, bit of a knock and a kick, you know, in, the, uh, in the, the ribs to wake him up. And what happens here is an incredible miracle. Because what happens is, Peter wakes up, he's in a bit of a daze, it's not all sinking in exactly immediately. As he stands up, the chains fall off supernaturally. The angel says, quick, put your clothes and sandals on or follow me. There are the guards right next to him. They don't see anything, hear anything, they're just taken care of. He walks past the first set of police and then a second set of police, security guards all through, goes out into the city. The city gate opens automatically and into Jerusalem they go, into the city. 
and then presumably the gate closes behind them. And then suddenly Peter comes to his senses and thinks, wow, now I know this is a miracle, amazing miracle. He says, I'm going to get out of here quickly because Herod's after me. If he sees me, I'm, he's going to just arrest me again. But just before he, uh, he, um, he, he, he leaves, he thinks, I'm going to go to the Christian. He thinks, I'll go to the, the mother of John Mark's house. John Mark was one of the disciples, and he goes to the mother of John Mark's house. And do you know what? Here, there's a whole group of Christians. They're having a prayer meeting. And do you know what they're praying for? They're praying for a miracle. They're praying for a miracle that Paul will not be put to death. They're praying for a miracle that Paul will not be, you know, put to the sword, which is what happened to James and is going to happen. They're praying for a miracle that Peter would be released from prison. But the interesting thing is, when Peter goes and knocks on the door, and Rhoda, the, the girl, opens the door, and she hears Peter's voice, even though they're praying for a miracle inside the house, they don't even believe it. It can't be Peter. You must be imagining it. And then eventually they go to the door. Wow, it really is Peter. God, you have answered our prayer. You've performed a miracle. And Peter just quickly explains what's happened and then you know, gets away from Jerusalem for a while in order to you know, save his life. An incredible miracle takes place here. It's, it's astounding. And you know, just as the gift of healing is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. All of the gifts of the Holy Spirit are to build up the church, to strengthen us. The gift of prophecy is to build up and encourage. The gift of healing is to help and to bless. The gift of miracles is not just a purely selfish miracle, God, I want this or that. It's a miracle that builds up. And, and here we, you know, we read it in other places about the gift of miracles. It's another gift of the Holy Spirit, just like the gift of healing. And again, the gift of miracles is a gift that no Christian should despise. It's not a gift that stopped as if God stopped 2,000 years ago. God didn't stop 2,000 years ago. He didn't change his character. He didn't change his personality. He didn't change his gifting. And the gifting that he released to the early church, he's released to every church since. The only question is, are we a, a church, are we a Christian that will plug in to God the Holy Spirit, or will we resist him and leave him at arm's length? But it's a gift that, again, you and I, I mean, it's not every day that God is likely to answer all the New Testament. He hasn't changed. So, <clears throat> we've looked at Peter, we've looked at five different snapshots of Peter during different points of the book of Acts. I'm sorry that I've jumped into these different ones without we need to be here for many hours to, to have read all of the backdrop, but that perhaps is your homework, and I encourage you, read the book of Acts. Read the book of Acts for yourself and ask God to speak to you through it. And um, in fact, the, the summary points are on here. You can jot them down. You can go and read, you know, read a bit more in, about, read the whole of Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 12, and you'll see the context for what we've been looking at as we've taken various windows, snapshots of Peter's life. So as we come to bring it all together, <clears throat> how open and desiring are you for God, the Holy Spirit, to transform your life? It's a question we all need to bring before God. God's waiting for our answer. If you were to think of the picture of your life before you became a Christian, remember that old car that was all wrecked and whatever, if you were to think of your life, the picture before you became a Christian and now after, how much have you welcomed and allowed the Holy Spirit to change and cleanse and get off all that rust and rubbish and weeds and, and, and all of those sort of things? Because God, by his Holy Spirit, always wants to take us closer to Jesus, nearer to him, that we might be more like God in our character, that we might be more like God in the things that we do, in everything. That is why the person and the power of God's Holy Spirit is so important. We need to welcome him and embrace him. And it's a little bit like in the Old Testament, you know, the lump of clay and the potter. God and the Holy Spirit in particular is the potter. 
who shapes and molds that lump of just clay, the old, before we became a Christian, and wants to mold us into that beautiful object vase that's pleasing in God's sight. And it's as we welcome God the Holy Spirit, God, change my character. Lord, I'm struggling in this area. I've got this bit of rust. I've got these weeds in my life. God, I don't want them. They've been there for 40 years. I've been a Christian. Please, God, take them away. It's as we welcome and ask God the Holy Spirit to work inside of us that he will. And he will make us like that beautiful, bright, gleaming, shining blue mini, except it's our own lives. So what is your before and after? And whatever the after is, there will be change, but God wants as Christians us to continue to become ever more like him. Don't hit a point where you don't change anymore, where you don't allow the Holy Spirit to keep moving you closer to Jesus anymore. That is to stagnate. That is to walk backwards. Keep walking hand in hand with Jesus, hand in hand with God the Holy Spirit. He is the one who can change and transform your life and my life. Let's close our eyes for a moment. Let's close our eyes. And before we rush on to the next part of the service, let's just listen to what is God saying to us. I really sense there's a number of things that God wants to do in, in our lives, in all of our lives. I know that God wants us to receive a holy boldness, a holy boldness, that we might be a more effective witness for Jesus. Are you willing to be that, just like Peter was? You don't have to preach a sermon like him, but you can still be a witness. Are you open to receive and ask God for the gift of healing or the gift of miracles? Asking that God might stretch you and grow you in that area of your life. Are you willing to receive just a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit? We need that infilling every day, not just Sundays, every day. We need to be filled afresh with God the Holy Spirit. It's not an event that just happens historically. It's an ongoing relationship with God. And are you, am I willing to really be plugged into the Holy Spirit, to realize the depth of my need for the third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit? I'd just like to pray for a moment and if you want to just stand up where you are and say yes God I want to just receive that holy boldness that fresh infilling maybe it's a gift of healing or miracles or or whatever it might be being just more connected to God the Holy Spirit then just stand up where you are and I'm going to pray and your standing up is an act of boldness in itself is an act of, of, of boldness and commitment just as Peter stood up and 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 didn't mind what the crowd think, didn't mind what the Sanhedrin thought. thought. Just stand up, and at, at, as you stand, I'm going to pray that the dove of God's Holy Spirit will come and descend upon you, that God the Holy Spirit will come and equip and empower you, that God the Holy Spirit would ignite His flame within your life. So, Lord, I'm standing up. Many of us standing up, Lord God, and Father, we thank you for what you did in the life of Peter. Thank you so much. We see just the before and after the transformation, and it's God the Holy Spirit working in his life. And we thank you for that, Lord. And Lord Jesus, we're standing like Peter, saying, Lord, you know the lump of clay that I am, that we are. Oh, Lord, we're asking to be plugged in to the Holy Spirit, to allow the Holy Spirit to be poured out upon us. And I pray for each dear brother and sister standing up. I pray for pouring out of the oil of the Holy Spirit upon your life, His Holy Spirit filling you and flowing within you. I pray for the water of God's Holy Spirit to come and wash you, to wash off the rust from us, 
the, the dig up the weeds in our lives to, to begin to increasingly transform us, Lord God. Oh, we welcome you, Holy Spirit. We welcome your presence in our lives. And Lord, I pray that you would light a fire of holy boldness within us, giving us a confidence that we've never had before, a trust in you. We are standing on the rock that is Jesus. May we have that confidence and trust like never before, Lord God. And Father, for some of us, for all of us, Lord, we were open to receiving gifts of the Holy Spirit, and especially the gift of healing and the gift of miracles we've been thinking about today. Lord, would you move us amazingly and mightily by the power of your Spirit, Lord. So Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, I invite your presence just to come and fill us. May you know the heat, the warmth of God's Holy Spirit at work in your life. May you know the wind of God's Holy Spirit blowing within you. May you know the water of God's Holy Spirit washing and refreshing you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And I pray that you would impart all the gifts of your Holy Spirit as well, every gift of your Holy Spirit, that we might be so much more effective so much more awake, so much more alive to you, Lord God Almighty. Holy Spirit, just come. Dove of peace, just rest upon each one of us. We ask and pray. Go deep in our hearts, Lord God. Father, where we struggled for breakthrough, I pray today for breakthrough, for Holy Spirit breakthrough in our lives, Lord God Almighty. Thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. And may we continue daily to welcome your presence, to change and transform us. May we return in weeks ahead with testimonies of how God the Holy Spirit has worked in us just as he worked in Peter 2,000 years ago. We pray these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen.